Hello, I'm Ben Langmead. I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins Computer Science, and this is a brief video uh, to accompany a paper that's about to appear called Dashing Fast and Accurate Genomic Distances with Hyperloglog, -Log, which is primarily the work of student Daniel Baker, who's pictured here on the slide. So the purpose of this uh, video is to talk a little bit about sketching in general, uh, and in particular to explain two different kinds of sketches that have been used to summarize genomic data sets the minhash sketch and the hyperloglog -log sketch, and to do so in a way that emphasizes their uh, commonalities. And then also eventually to present some of the results for this new software tool called Dashing, which uses the hyperloglog -log sketch to summarize genomic data sets. So sketching is a kind of tool that's been um, increasingly used in genomics and its job, the job of sketching is really to sift and summarize very large Data sets. So these could be large collections of assembled genomes, like all the uh, assembled genomes in RefSeq, for example, or large collections of sequencing data sets, like maybe many uh, single cell sequencing data sets. And then to do this in a way that allows us to ask similarity questions later. Uh, so, and hopefully we can do this using very, very compact data structures, data structures where maybe just a single bit of the data structure is standing in for tens or hundreds of kilobases worth of input data. And it's data structures like these that are so small that we really can hope to fit them in memory and to work with them interactively and quickly. And this has been used in a lot of different areas in genomics in the past. I'll highlight just a couple here. Um, one is, uh, this is the uh, paper describing the MHAP algorithm where it uses something like a minhash sketch or a minimizer scheme to try to find uh, pairs of sequencing reads that look like they might be uh, two reads that you might want to glue together in a genome assembly. And here's another piece of work about a tool called FastANI that uses sketching and compares sketches in order to get uh, an estimate of the average nucleotide identity between two sequencing data sets so that you can ask questions like, how similar are two strains of a particular species and things like this. These are just two, two of many examples of where people have been applying sketching approaches in uh, genomics. Okay, so how do we use sketching? Well, if we start with some genomic data, so maybe a genome that's represented by the, the blue FASTA files you see here, or maybe a sequencing data set represented by these green FASTQ files, we prepare it for sketching by first turning it into uh, an intermediate form, typically by just sort of shredding the genomes into their constituent uh, kamers. And then these are shunted through a hash function and then introduced to the sketch. And uh, some will sort of pass the test and make it into the sketch and others will not affect uh, the final uh, sketch. More on this later. Um, so this is how sketches are built, but really their utility lies in their ability to estimate cardinalities, uh, sizes of sets, like the ones you see to the right here. These then can feed into similarity measures like the Jacquard coefficient, um, and uh, the ratio, which is the ratio of the cardinality of the intersection between two sets and the cardinality of the union between those two sets. Then these in turn can feed into measures of biological relatedness like the average nucleotide identity, for example. But the uh, ultimate wellspring of everything that we'd like to accomplish here really depends on our ability to use a sketch to estimate cardinalities like the ones you see on the right. Uh, uh, and so let's start by seeing how sketches can be used to estimate these cardinal cardinalities, starting with the simple ones and then moving on to the more complicated ones like the union and the intersection cardinalities. So let me use an analogy here. Let's say I have a deck of a thousand cards labeled one through a thousand, and I'm going to choose a random subset of those cards and put them in my hat. And what you'd like to know is how many cards do I have in my hat, the cardinality. Uh, but there's a rule that says, uh, first of all, you can't see inside my hat. And then second of all, you can only ask me for one representative card. Now you can choose the representative based on say a quantile. So like for example, you might ask for the median of the numbers on the cards in my hat, or you might ask for the minimum of the numbers of the cards in my hat. So let's try out minimum and see how that works. 
So what if I told you that the minimum of all the cards in my hat was 500? Remember, the cards are labeled 1 to 1,000. So what if I told you the minimum was 500? How many cards would you think might be in the hat? Well, if 500 is the minimum, probably I don't have very many cards in my hat, right? If I did have a large number of cards in my hat and the minimum was 500, uh, that would be a big coincidence because what it would mean is, n despite having many cards, none of those cards has a number on it that's less than the midpoint of the range. So that would be a big coincidence. If instead the number of uh, the minimum of the cards in my hat was say 10, then we might guess a larger cardinality. And if the minimum were still lower, like four, uh, we would estimate a still larger cardinality and so on. So you can see that as the minimum is shrinking, our estimate of the cardinality should grow. And indeed we can convert whatever the minimum is, we can convert that into an estimate of the overall cardinality, basically making an assumption that the, uh, since the subset was chosen randomly, then the, the cards in that subset should be spread uniformly across this uh, range. So note also that the minimum is an extremely easy representative to pick. It's definitely easier it, with a huge data stream rushing by to pick out the minimum than it is to pick out, say, the median. Okay, so also having picked just one representative out of the data from the, f to use to make our estimate, our entire summary of that data, our sketch, if you will, that fits in just 10 bits, okay? Because we can index up to 1,000, you know, integers up to 1,000 using just 10 bits. Okay, so if this problem seems sort of contrived and only good for a classroom, uh, it actually corresponds to the very typical situation where after obtaining k-mers, we use a hash function to transform each k-mer into a number. And uh, an ideal hash function will just distribute those numbers basically uniformly across the range of the hash function. So if this is a 32-bit hash function, it's taking data objects, these could be strings or something else, and it's converting them into numbers, and those numbers are spread across from zero up to, let's say, two to the 32 minus one, if it's a 32-bit hash function, or two to the 64, if it's a 64-bit hash function. And so this sends us straight back to the hat problem, but where the numbers on the cards are the values coming out of the hash function, okay? So let's move now to the problem of estimating cardinalities of functions of sets, like unions and intersections. And now we're, we're concerned really with how many items are present in both sets as opposed to in just one or the other of the two sets. In other words, we're concerned with how, how often the items sort of coincide between the two sets. And so we can visualize this in the following way, and this is inspired, uh, this way of depicting it is inspired by a figure from the MASH screen paper from Adam Phillippe's group that just appeared. And I have these horizontal bars here representing the ranges of values that are, that are possible. And a triangle is pointing to each item that's present in a set. And so where items in the sets coincide, in other words, where the triangles line up vertically, I'll draw a black bar. And a black bar marks an item that's in the intersection between the two sets. And then for values that don't coincide, I'll draw a red bar. A red bar is an item that's in the union, but not in the intersection. This is also called the symmetric difference. It's in the symmetric difference of the two sets. Okay, so notice uh, that we would not learn much just by looking at the minimum value from the two sets. If we took the minimum from A and the minimum from B all the way on the left, those two are connected by a black line, okay. But does that mean that every item is in the intersection? That would not be a very robust conclusion to draw. And likewise, if we chose the maximum items from both sets instead of the minimum items from both sets, now we'd be all the way over on the right. We would pick those two triangles that have red bars over top of them. What could we conclude? Could we conclude that nothing's in the intersection? That wouldn't be a robust conclusion either. So we start to, we start to uh, come to the realization that if we want to be able to estimate things like union and intersection cardinalities well, we need to start looking at more than just one representative from each set. We need many representatives from each set. Just fundamentally, there's a large space of possible coincidences. Because that space is large, we need to increase the number of opportunities we have to observe a, a coincidence or a non-coincidence. So one strategy for this would be, 
instead of taking just the minimum, we can take the bottom three. So we can take the minimum, the second minimum, and the third minimum shown inside this red box. Uh, and we can check these and, and we'll find two instances where those items are in the intersection, black bars, and then two instances where those items are not in the intersection, they're in the symmetric difference, red bars. And from that we can estimate things like union and intersection cardinality, or even the Jacquard coefficient. And so this idea, this is called a bottom K sketch, with K being a, a parameter that we can adjust, and the higher we make K, uh, the larger our sketch, but uh, it also gives us more opportunities uh, to get, we give ourselves more opportunities to find the coincidences or the non-coincidences that ultimately we're going to sort of sum up in order to form our cardinality estimates. So before moving on, let's see one alternative to the bottom K approach, which um, I'll call the K partition approach. And here we begin by dividing the ranges into partitions. And so here I show three different colored partitions. And now instead of taking the bottom three from both sets, I will take the minimum within each partition for both sets. And like with the bottom K sketch, I've given myself three opportunities to observe a coincidence or a non-coincidence uh, of the values between the two sets. I've just gone about it in a slightly different way, <clears throat> but that seems to accomplish uh, much the same thing. And another thing I'll say is that since k is a parameter, of course we can adjust k up or down, making k larger in either case, for bottom k or for k partition, making k larger leads to there being more representatives in the sketch, so the sketch gets bigger, but it also leads to higher resolution, greater ability to estimate these cardinalities. Okay, so many people will, have, will know of a, a, of a software tool called MASH, a great and very popular uh, software tool for sketching and comparing genomics data sets, and it uses a strategy called bottom K minhash sketching. And this is essentially the approach that we've outlined so far. Right? We talked about the hashing part, we talked about the min part, that's the taking the minimum, and we talked about the bottom K part, that's the way we get many representatives so that we have more to work with when we go to estimate things like the union and intersection cardinalities. And a MASH sketch is really just a set, it's just a list uh, of the bottom K representatives um, uh, from the constituent sets. And so one such representative fits in as many bits as are needed to index the range of the hash function. So for a 32-bit hash function, we need 32 bits to store the representative. And for a 64-bit hash function, we need 64 bits to store the representative. Okay, we're about to get to the hyperloglog -log sketch that's coming in a moment, but the last piece I want to talk about before I get to hyperloglog -log involves one idea for how to shrink the space used to store these representatives. So, what if, instead of taking the minimum as the representative, we take the log minimum, or more specifically, we take the log base 2 of the minimum and then round it down to the nearest integer. So now a representative takes not log u bits to store, but log log u bits. And that's where this uh, log log part of the name hyperloglog log comes from. Okay, so in the case of a 32-bit hash function, for example, that's the difference between one of these representatives taking 32 bits versus one of the representat representatives taking just 5 bits. And therefore, because they're only five bits, we can sort of pack six of them plus a little bit into the same space that we would have used to store one of the original unlogged uh, representatives. Um, and uh, the ability to store more representatives in the same amount of space is really a, a gift uh, because uh, when it comes time to form our estimates, uh, we have more samples. And when you have more samples, you sort of get more averaging. The downside, of course, is that we're throwing away information when we log and then truncate. And so while we can reverse it partially by re-exponentiating, we can't get back what was lost when we rounded. Uh, and this adds both some, some forms of uh, error and bias uh, to our estimate. Is the trade worthwhile? 
Well, stay tuned because I'll show some results in a moment. Um, okay, now I'm ready to introduce our software tool, which is called Dashing, and it's based on something called the hyperloglog sketch. So let me say first uh, that this is the work of PhD student Daniel Baker, who's just an exceptionally skilled programmer, who's really done a great job building a fast and usable software tool, but who's also uh, uh, done a lot of work to create libraries uh, around the sketches that are implemented in Dashing. So if you're a, a developer, if you're interested in these methods, uh, you would likely benefit from checking out both the tool and the libraries uh, that Daniel's made available. So Dashing is based on the hyperloglog log sketch, which is illustrated here. It's a diagram from the paper. And if the diagram looks a tad complicated, fear not, because it's really just a combination of four things that we've discussed so far. So here on the left, we're doing K partitioning, right? That was the strategy where we divided the range of the hash function up into chunks. And then we said, we're gonna take the minimum from each of those chunks, okay? The next thing we're doing, uh, labeled number two here, is taking the truncated log, okay? Like we just discussed so that the, we're getting a logged representative that fits in log log of u bits. Now, classically, what HLLs will do here is not quite the truncated log, but something related to that called the leading zero count. And I'll come back to this a little bit later. Uh, label number three, next we're re-exponentiating. And then finally, labeled four, we're performing averaging and bias correction over the estimates from, from each partition. I won't talk much about that here, but I'll have a reference at the end of the presentation that tells you more about how we do that. Um, so numbers one and two on this slide are the things that we would do when building the hyperloglog log sketch, so when we're adding things to it. And then items three and four are the things that we would do when we were going to estimate a cardinality using the sketch. So this hyperloglog log data structure has been around since around 2007 or so, and it has been applied elsewhere in bioinformatics. This is really the first time it's been evaluated as a competitor to MinHash for um, comparing genomic data sets. And to go a little bit further, in Dashing, we've brought a couple of optimizations and improvements to the hyperloglog log paradigm. I'll discuss two of these. So first of all, we make heavy use of, of what are called vector instructions, or also sometimes called SIMD instructions. Uh, and these are very well suited to the HLL because the HLL itself is, at the end of the day, really nothing but an array of bytes, a bunch of bytes. And SIMD instructions can really greatly speed up operations performed over arrays of bytes by performing many parallel operations over a span of elements in the array. So for example, the, the task, the very common task of combining two HLLs into a new HLL that represents the union of the original uh, requires simply that we take an element-wise minimum of both vectors. And so with SIMD instructions, we can do this very easily for simultaneous chunks of elements from the two vectors. Um, it's a uh, uh, very easy operation, and the ability to do it in chunks of up to, say, 32 or 64 elements at a time really speeds up our ability to do things like take the union. Also, uh, you'll recall um, earlier I explained the hyperloglog log in terms of the truncated log, the, lo the truncated log minimum, log minimum rounded down. But then later I had to admit that classical HLL actually uses something else called leading zero count. So in dashing, we really did replace uh, the leading zero count with the truncated log. And we did this in order to avoid wasting valuable space. So to see this, consider that we've been given a 64-bit hash value to add, to potentially add to our sketch. That's the value that you see in the blue rectangle on this slide. If you're curious why you're seeing both numbers and letters there, that's because I've written the number in what's called hexadecimal. It doesn't matter, it's really just a really big number. Um, and so if we take the log base two, or if we take the leading zero count, either way, we get a result that can only be as high as around 64. All right, so it requires only about six bits to store that result. Once we take the leading zero count or the log base two, the result fits in about six bits. 
But we then proceed to install this value into an entire byte worth of the final data structure. So we're putting six bits, but we're putting it in a space that has enough space for eight bits. So we're wasting two of the eight bits. And that means that 25% of the final data structure, if we were to do this, would not really have any utility. It wouldn't be contributing toward the accuracy of our cardinality estimates, for example. So since dashing really is using the truncated log, not the leading zero count, uh, we can simply adjust the base of the log. The base of the log doesn't have to be two. We can sort of nudge the base of the log down so that instead of the maximum value coming out of the log being only up to around 64, which fits in six bits, we adjust it so that the maximum value that comes out is around 255, which is uh, just fits within eight bits. So it makes use of all eight of the available bits of the final uh, of the register in the final uh, data structure, right? And so the particular log is whatever log gives you 255 when you log two to the 64, which it ends up being around 1.19 is the log base. Okay, and so <clears throat> now we have a somewhat higher fidelity estimate, thanks to use of using all eight of those bits in every register of the HLL. This helps us get better cardinality estimates at the end of the day. Okay, now I'm going to briefly highlight three results uh, from the dashing study. And here's the first one. So first, we showed that dashing and the, the HLL, the hyperloglog, log, seem to go quite some way toward addressing a problem that was highlighted in some past literature and that pointed out that the bottom k min hash, uh, the, you know, the strategy used by MASH, produces poor Jacquard coefficient estimates when the sets that are being compared are very different sizes, very different cardinalities. So what we seem to observe is that this is due less to the min hash strategy per se and more to the bottom k strategy. Uh, and, uh, a similar point is being made actually in the, in the recent MASH screen publication that just appeared. And uh, we think it's largely because dashing is, and the HLL are using a K partition strategy rather than a bottom K strategy that it's able to produce much more accurate Jacquard similarity estimates than the bottom K min hash. And this is true across a range of sketch sizes as seen in this figure taken from the paper. In another experiment, we took some real bacterial genomes and we formed 400 pairings of those genomes that altogether achieved an even distribution across the range of true Jacquard coefficients from zero uh, all the way up to one. And we calculated the true Jacquard coefficient for each of these pairs using a very big and not practical data structure, but we did that just for the purpose of knowing what the correct answer was. Uh, so that we could do these experiments. And very consistently across the full range of uh, true Jacquard similarities, dashing produced very accurate uh, Jacquard similarity estimates. Consistently more accurate than MASH and quite competitive with another uh, excellent tool called BinDash, uh, which uses a different variation on the min hash idea, which is called B-bit minwise hashing. And then finally, we did a large experiment wherein we took a collection of over 87,000 uh, bacterial genomes. And for each of these tools, MASH, BINDASH, and DASHing, we at first asked the tool to sketch all the genomes. And all of these tools, by the way, are very good at using many threads, many simultaneous threads of execution. Uh, and so we asked all of them to use close to the full number of available threads on the computer that we were, we were using, and they all made good use of those threads. And then, once we built all those sketches, with the help of those sketches, we asked the tools to estimate all the pairwise distances, all the pairwise Jacquard similarities between all of those uh, genomes. Uh, so we, this, they were comparing many, many, many pairs of bacterial genomes. And what we found was, consistently, over all the experiments we did, um, dashing was the fastest tool at producing the sketches, and we found that when the sketches are relatively small, so for example, the table I'm showing you here is for sketches that are about one kilobyte. When the sketches are relatively small, uh, bin dash, I'm sorry, dashing is the fastest overall when you take into account both the building of the sketches and the calculation of all the pairwise 
jacquard similarities. Um, as you can see, for this particular experiment, dashing is finishing in about six minutes overall. Bin dash is finishing closer to 20 minutes. Mash is finishing in about 50 minutes. So overall, we see that dashing is the, is the fastest at sketching. And it's the fastest overall, even when you include the distance estimation, for the smaller sketches. It's when we get to bigger sketches that we start to see bin dash exhibiting a better speed compared to dashing. So with that, thank you for listening. I'd love to point out these references, which uh, especially the very last one on cardinality estimation, since this is one of the issues that I largely glossed over in this presentation, but it's a very important one for the performance of HLL-based sketching methods. And of course, I want to encourage you to read um, our paper, uh, the dashing paper listed at the top here. There's a link to the preprint there, but the uh, main paper in genome biology is in press and should appear soon. Uh, thanks very much.